<laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> you can see Haneli is always joyful and <laughs> laughing. <laughs> I'm Heidi from the Wisdom Factory, <laughs> and actually, I want to uh, interview or have a conversation with Hanneli about her new ebook, which is call it, called Sharing Corn, and it's quite an amazing thing. And you know, before we go into that, I would like to, that you introduce yourself because you are far away from me. I'm in Italy, but you are about twelve hours in airplane sort of <laughs> so please say something about <laughs> yeah i mean thank you heidi i'm in johannesburg at the moment i see myself as a global citizen but there are certain places in the world that i love i was born south african and because of what's been happening in the last year i couldn't travel much so i'm currently in johannesburg and uh, it's really delightful to be here with you heidi thank you for the invitation yeah thank you i know you're from many conversation groups and I really appreciate your energy and whatever you are doing and now I find this book where I have contributed a part of it but you know just seeing it the first picture with a horse and the the dove I think it is it's a bird and over the field uh, it's of, a bird yeah. it's a yeah very nice field you see and, and the, the the river in between you know all these colors and then you're only scrolling through you see that this book is made out of pure love so <laughs> i wonder you called it sharing corn and could you explain why sharing corn a few years ago in 2016 i got the inspiration from the story about the farmer in West Africa. And he was, every year he was producing the best seeds and the best corn. And, but he did a very interesting thing. He was sharing his seeds with his neighbors. And he won all the competitions for the best corn in the world. And a journalist from the USA heard about him and he flew over to interview him because he found that in this competitive world of ours, how could you do something like that? Because then next year you might not win the contest. And he went over to the farmer and the farmer was quite relaxed and he was sitting backwards and he said, but sir, how can you do that? It doesn't make sense. And the farmer just smiled very shyly and he said, but sir, don't you know that the wind comes and takes the corn and it germinates everything around it? So if I have bad seeds, if my neighbors have bad seeds then I'll have a bad harvest as well against me sharing my corn. So it inspired sharing wisdom and wisdom is light. That's why the birth is one in this specific edition. And sharing corn is also about that which is life giving, not so much as about what's right or wrong in our views, but what is life giving and life affirming and life nourishing. And we eat the earth like you shared in your piece in this about co-creating nature is so light with that because and I even get tears in my eyes now as I'm speaking about it. Because in, if we share our wisdom with the world freely, we're planting seeds all over the place. And in terms of awareness and leadership and self-leadership awareness at the moment, we can clearly see that we need another level of awareness to really transform what's happening in the world. All about raising awareness on different matters and then constructing and embodying new models of understanding. So that is the story that is behind the theme and the top and the title and also the subtitle. So I'm wondering, yes, we have a strange period uh, of our planet, let's say, you know, but I think it's also different. I say that because when I came to Italy about 35 years ago, everything was still different. When I bought the house here with olive trees, the neighbors came and uh, taught us how to collect the olives, how to cut the trees, uh, to prune the trees and everything that was still normal. That people came together also for harvesting the wine. And we did that all together. Nowadays, it's all dead. You know, it's even considered black work if you help your neighbor. So we have uh, invented structures which are really strange, let's say, in this sense. But 
what I wanted to say is that there are probably some countries, and I imagine also African countries, which are still nearer to this concept of sharing and others who are far away. So maybe that's the way to, or also the hope that in these countries, we can come up with this different way. And, and it's not so much different. <laughs> it was before, you know, we had sharing communities before, before this, all this money hype came into. So what do you say about that? Yeah, and you know, it's I'm completely aligning what you were you saying, resonating with that, because I have a very similar vision as yourself. In 2015, I joined the U Lab of Otto Schamer at MIT, and I designed a, a prototype for conscious living at the time. And it was very interesting because, like you say, we, we don't have that sense of, like in Africa, we still more have that sense of living closer to nature and more aligned with nature. Um, just because we are where, where we are at in the world at this moment in time. But it, on my personal experience, it opens up all your senses to life itself. And I was thinking about it the other day. About, and especially from Italian um, community perspective, I had dated in Italian many, many years ago for four years. So I had that experience of that culture. And although they were living in South Africa, they brought Italy, a little Italy here, you know, and I was in that community for four years. And having had that experience, my body still resonates with that, of people coming together and of sharing. But what really came up for me the other day in terms of planting seeds and harvesting them, what I really begin to realize what we've done in the past decade after the Second World War is that what's been happening is because we had to rebuild the world, people focus just on the harvesting side. So they would have an idea, they would put it into the world, make it happen, and then they just drain that. No new seeds are planted. So it, it, it drained the whole ecosystem in life, of life itself from economical point of view and on all other levels as well. If you look at it from an integral way, it had an impact everywhere. So it was this drive to recreate the world, but not realizing in that process, because we're not planting new seeds and regenerating the life cycle of life, we were draining it. And hence the effect on our planet, if you think in terms of climate change and the likes. And if people just realize there's nothing wrong to create something beautiful, but it's what are we giving back? What are we, and are we allowing the land to rest, the fallow, and not only the land, us as human beings as well, before we toil the soil that we can plant again? And so many people have created all these things, but I don't have time to enjoy it. And to, like you say, that lifestyle thing is missing, like you have in Italy, you know, you, you do, it's, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone now with Corona too, completely, you know, yeah. all this yeah. sitting together and uh, meeting each other, it's, it's completely disrupting culture. But, uh, you know, I think it's true, after the war, it has increased this thing, and the rebuilding was done with certain ideologies. And the ideologies come out when we talk about integral and out of the, in my opinion, from the orange mindset, everything which is doable, I want to do it, you know? So it started with the atomic bomb. It's doable, yeah, so let's do it, you know? And then later um, with all the other things. So where we are living now is the consequence of this idea that whatever I can do, I will do. I will go to the, to the last end without considering the consequences. We have lost the blue part or, yeah, uh, of, of let's say, morality we have lost the church was thought you can say whatever you want against the church but at least they kept you in a in a in a how can you say in a in, in a certain morality container so they said certain things are wrong and certain things are not right at least 
they they didn't work in a good way saying menacing making fear and things like that That's, i don't like that but in some way they gave direction you cannot do whatever you want to do just now and whatever you can do you have to think about the others and this in orange has been lost i think and green tries to go against it but they are um getting into new ideologies which are not helpful you know instead of undo this lack of responsibility for their own actions they adopt the same thing so they are also planting seeds which can go really into disaster as orange did already unfortunately uh, because green could have been a good a good counter movement and at, at the beginning it was actually but now it's gone crazy so um i wonder you know i'm a person who is always seeing let's say what is missing because i'm an enya type four and you are from the other side so i would like to you to give us some inspiration <laughs> <laughs> not only see what is missing. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, Heidi, when we see, and I myself have, my part of my journey was started of noticing what was missing. So I focused a lot on what was missing. And then I realized, but there's the other side to it as well, of seeing the bigger picture, of maybe seeing what's busy emerging in the same process of seeing what's missing. Because at least when you become, a, so again, awareness thing. The moment you become aware of something that's missing, you can put your awareness to some to the possible, to what is possible. Uh, and it's not to fix that what's missing, but it's to co-create a completely new reality. And I want to link it into what you shared about nature as well. Because if we look at the natural flow of life itself, it's forever flowing, it's forever moving. Life is never really stagnant. And maybe we, it even does make sense that we went into a state of status of, of uh, if, and we didn't want, you know, homeostasis. We didn't move because we want to hang on to what happened in the previous century. We didn't want that to happen again. So we were hanging on to what we've got and the consumption and all those type of things. But if you really look at it uh, from a flow perspective, that something's busy merging that is really full of life regardless of that, what's missing, of what's not working. And if we really first start focusing on what's really strong, is our ability to expand our awareness and to explore other levels and to engage and experiment with those. And maybe some are not ready for that, and that's also okay. But in the way I see it is that we come from a state where we were focusing on causation. So cause, cause and effect. So if I do this, then that's the effect. And I will always find something then, then that's missing or that's wrong or is no longer working. But in the effect, I completely miss out what is really busy coming out in the world. And we've seen through history all the time, your new eras. So I see this as a new era for us. And some does call it the age of awareness and the conceptual age where we become to see our impact of our actions. And that's what technology has allowed us to do that we begin to, because it opened up the whole world for us. So we can start to see, but we, we have impact. And like you said previously, perhaps this church was giving us like, a little, you know, like you said, the morality part of, we can't just go and do everything we want to do. But now we begin to see our impact on each other and on the planet. Where before we didn't have any clue with that. When I started my career of this university, that was, in, that was not even present. Nobody thought about the impact. And suddenly we have that ability through technology and the likes and communication that we can even engage like this right now, that we become to see our impact. But now instead of getting trapped in that causation type reality, we can really start focusing on and just putting our attention to, if I'm aware of this impact that I'm creating, I'm becoming more aware of my actions, my thoughts, my emotions, everything, my decisions. And as long as it's not fear-based, it's something that's alive. So there's a possibility. 
And if I start following the strength of that possibility of what's suddenly emerging around me and unfolding, what am I becoming aware of that's different? I'm making decisions from a different place. So it's also not that I can just do, do, do. Yes, I have that possibility. But I'm beginning to realize that this, it's, it has an effect. I saw a very interesting um, documentary the other night. And it happened, you know, it happened, I was really exhausted. I had a 20 hour day <laughs> because I was just recording a Softening the Edges of Change workshop that uh, the Change Management Network asked me to share with the people last month, which I did. And then people said, but you must share this wider. It's so, it's so powerful. So I had a 20 hour day because I wanted to really complete it and put it out in the world. And then I was just wanted to relax because I knew if I went to sleep like six o'clock that next night, it's not going to work. I will wake up in the middle of the night the next morning. So I just put on, the, on Netflix and I saw this, um, this documentary about the financial collapses in 2008. And as I was sitting there, I could clearly see that this planting the seeds and just harvesting, just taking, taking, why that happened on some levels, but also how it opens up a completely new type of economy for us for, because it had to collapse. And maybe we are due for another one. I don't know. Yeah. And maybe it is helping that along in a very really weird way that we can look at it that from this causation type reality, that we can become to follow the flow of what's alive, that we begin to realize what I'm doing now is not life affirming. And that's awareness thing of becoming aware of my, so it's not to blame or to shame or to have guilt about what I'm doing, because that's not helpful either. But then I'm myself projecting myself into another level. Mm -hmm. How I'm, it's not like a hierarchy level, it's purely to notice that I'm following a spiral of what's alive versus what's life draining. Because then I'm coming back to the bottom and then I'm just taking, taking, grabbing, grabbing. And I see that as exciting because that spiral is full of energy and it, 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 it really lifts us up beyond what we ever could have perceived. And what it reminded me of when I was watching this, this documentary was that it's reminding me of where we act from, the act the parts of our brain, our primitive brain or our limbic brain where it's really reactive and we really want to hang on to what we have or where are we really entering the frontal prefrontal lobes of our brain where it's where we have can access our consciousness and we can see the bigger picture and that's what i really am am, am delightful of that that's busy emerging that that whatever has happened has happened in 2020 is giving us even because a lot of people couldn't see it they couldn't perceive it of their, their impact on each other and on the planet. And our nature is showing us, just looking around ourselves, of if we just follow the cycle of nature, naturally speaking, and when we're in nature and when we live in nature, how we can co-create a better future. That's what I'm really, really excited about. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. It reminded me when you started to talk, uh, it's a little bit like, Einstein is said to have said that you cannot uh, resolve the problems on the same level that you are creating. And this being mindful, being more aware of, of what is going on, that's definitely a tool which we haven't used in the past yet, which came in with green uh, development. No? And now uh, we can use that in a healthy green or even integral state stage not state <laughs> state yeah sometimes we are in states of very different things <laughs> uh, so it makes also sense that this happens now when enough people not many but maybe enough people uh have have begun to create and to uh, act on this level you know that's nice and i do think that um the 2008 crash was the preparation for now because actually it is a crash already happening only we don't see it we, we are so much concerned about a virus or something you know because uh, it's sort of covering uh, what is really happening but as you said it has to to fall apart before it can be 
something new. And I have to admit, in this year, with everything going different, also for me, almost nothing, because I live here as I mm -hmm. lived all the time, and I'm with you and other people on the internet and have this wonderful exchange. But still, it's impacting you, even if you are almost free of it. And I realized that I begin to be curious about many things I really didn't know. I was not interested in politics. I was not interested in all this stuff. And now I'm reading and I'm learning about history. Many things I didn't know. I just, you know, thought it's, it's what, the, what the little I know, that's enough, but it's not. And as you say, no, when you begin to see the, the connections, then it's so much more, first of all, understandable what is happening. Not that you agree with what is happening. That's not, that's not the case. But, but you become also the idea that some interruption obviously was necessary because out of, you know, there have been enough people to say, we cannot go along like this. We are consuming the earth and we are in this health system. We have makes us Ill, more ill than, than healthy and whatever. There were so many warners around, but it had no effect. And now is the possibility that other voices emerge, courageous people who, who might have a, some of them have not a bigger mindset. They're just against and whatever, no? But they are among those people who, who have a, a more integral view, let's say, without referring necessarily to the, to the theory. They have the capacity of, of seeing more, of connecting the dots more. And for, first of all, not believing that they know everything and that this okay. becomes a dogma, but that they are open to, to receive other people's not only opinions but also ways of seeing ways of being and so i'm on this level i'm very confident that something good at the end will come out also probably many very bad things will come out too so yeah planting the seeds i always thought in my life that i'm planting seeds <laughs> you were <laughs> But I haven't shared corn yet. I share vegetable because we don't have corn. <laughs> Whatever type of seed, it is good. But I wanted to say to you, you know, I, 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 was, I was also not so much affected last year because I was so busy doing stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Experiences with people online. But it was just, it, it was just natural to me. But what, uh, what I was realizing is that it's good that people, you know, people were provoked for the first time in their lives, because they were so in this box they lived. And in one of the chapters that I'm sharing, it's called, are you a bubble rider or a wave rider? And in there, if you read that, they almost probably see what I'm talking about now, because it was good because people were in, this, in these bubbles and they didn't question anything. They were just living by it. They didn't quit. And suddenly there was this restriction upon them. And there was a lot of provocation for them to act out. So it doesn't matter how they acted out. It was the good that they did act out because it broke the bubble. And even if they did, they not themselves aware yet what's happening with them inside themselves and why they really acted out, it's all good because there was just this, there had to be this tension to, in, we call it creative tension, but something you can emerge. It was good that that happened, even though they may have very silly comments online or comments online that in the social media world that it was, you know, they always start hating each other. It, it did create some hate as well. But if you really look at it from another level, it was good that they start expressing themselves to become self-autonomous again. And um, why, you know, I've just allowed all this stuff to happen for other people to make decisions on my behalf. Mm. And I thought it was good, but, and now I realized, but it wasn't good. And it's not necessarily good for me. It doesn't matter whether it's for the person next to me. So it's like, like people can begin to think independently again for themselves, because we don't learn that at school at all, how to think independently. Yeah. And like you say, connecting dots for ourselves. Yeah, I, I learned uh, that um, there are 70 year cycles 
And obviously we, we have come into a new cycle and I hope that this bubble thing don't, doesn't explode into wars, but that they really go into this awareness. I heard this morning a talk by Richard Rohr and he says, as also Jordan Peterson says, there is always a change between order and chaos and reorder and mm -hmm. again chaos and so on. Mm -hmm. And Richard Rohr made us notice that the people who are younger than, let's say, 40, they were born not into order, but already into chaos. And so they didn't have boundaries. And this is even worse for what has happened in the world, because they are even more the idea, I can do what I want, you know. So this uh, event, now we have so strict boundaries, you know, <laughs> For me, it's totally exaggerated, but uh, obviously it was needed by some divine force or whoever, uh, who, who, which guided us, our the, what's happening on the earth, let's say, to, to create these strict boundaries. You know, I'm thinking a little bit about uh, maybe the 12 step programs no? for people who learn to integrate boundaries if, if they didn't have it from in their education and their families. So maybe something of that is going on on the on the global level now. I, I'm not sure. I certainly don't agree and I'm not happy about what is happening, but maybe it's needed. And then seeing you and other groups, they're undercover, not noisy, but very silent. There are many, many people who are working <laughs> In, in this positive direction, you know, so maybe there comes the moment, you know, where, where this switches and that you are working with leadership, that this sort of leadership t can take over, take over is already like a, a war expression, but can, can take the lead, let's say, and, and uh, guide us in another future of which nobody of us has really an idea how exactly it looks like. We have only a vision, no? How it could be. So I would like to ask you, what is your vision of the future world in your, let's say, not, not only personal life, in let's say in your country or then on the global scale? Well, how actually, would you like to live <laughs> in which world? <laughs> I have to admit that when you're asking that, your question already hit me at my heart level because I'm so sensitive. I felt in my heart. Too. So I want to live heart-based from the heart. And when I speak about living from the heart, or my experience of it rather, is that it is not this victim type world. It is that all can thrive on whatever level they want to thrive and whatever perce their perception is of thriving. But it is a world where, um, and I have a piece in the journal about a different view on equality, which opens it up completely on how we look at the dualities. So I would love to live in a world where we don't live in that type of world where we see dualities or opposites and the likes, where we begin to live from our core essence, which is in, uh, enabling us not to fall back into that victim type world of slavery, of imperialism, of consumerism and the likes, whatever we want to call those type of things. So when I feel it in my body, it's where everybody has an opportunity to really blossom over and over again. And what I mean by that is that we, through our education systems and everything, we get the opportunity to be able to like be like a country rose, which just blossom over and over and can use all our talents and abilities and whatever is happening around ourselves, that we have that flexibility and freedom to be able to do that. And I do feel that's the world that we're busy co-creating all together, is that type of world undercover. And that seed is already busy germinating and it's wanting to push its head and to push its head through the ground. The soil is hard. It's, it, there needs to be something. And that's what I see what's happening now in the world as well. For that seed, whatever it might look like, like you said, none of us know what that seed will look like. We have a feeling and a, we have an aspiration of what it might want to, need to look like, with what we want it to look like. 
But we have a sense that whatever it is, it, there is a lot of life in it. It is not what we've been experienced in the last hundred years. Yeah, it has even less life uh, all the time. Yeah, it was against life, actually. Yeah. I was thinking, yes, the ground is very hard sometimes, and I put seeds in the ground, and sometimes they don't come out because it's too hard. Then you have to see it again and hope that it comes out. But then, as soon as it's out, it is still very uh, weak. So you have to take care for. I We didn't have rain for five weeks now. And the little uh, seedlings, I have to give them water. But I don't, have, don't give them too much because then they are drowned. So you have to be very careful with these seeds. First of all, how you put them, if you put them too much in the bottom, then they don't come out. If they do them too much on the surface, then uh, they might get the, the cold and uh, die before they can uh, sprout. And then as soon as they made it, you have to be very careful. We have to become again stewards of the world and not see the world as this material thing which we can do whatever we way we can all this plastic you know just we throw it away every time i have things in plastic which is almost inevitable wherever you buy mm -hmm. things there comes some plastic with and i throw it away and then in the in the bin and i think oh, and this plastic or is burnt and then all this stuff goes in the air or is buried in india or in africa somewhere and is ruining the land there. So <laughs> I've now I forgot my thread. <laughs> it was something about taking care for yeah, stewarding, nourishing. And that's yeah. not part of TV. Look at nourishing. Mm -hmm. Nourishing hasn't been part of our way of living, not in schooling, not in education. It was about achievement. Do, do, do. There was not no time to grow and to nourish. And like you say, nourishing the soil, and the soil must be fertile as well for something to grow. So the conditions around the, you know, our attitudes, our thoughts, our belief systems, our ideas, our emotions, it's all feeding everything around ourselves. And it's, it is that nourishing part is being missing of it through education. It's missing in the business world. It's not part of it because it's just achieve, achieve, achieve. There's no time for nourishment. And like you say, in too much nourishment, again, we'll also smother it, like you said. Uh, and it's a balance, it's a fine balance of life, of not just the, the acting, doing, doing part, it's the being part as well. And to, not, then, and to allow ourselves to be nourished and to nourish others. And to be aware, and we come back to what you say, to become more aware and more, I almost would say intuitive, to be more, to sense more into the need of, of, of the, instead of saying, oh, you have to see it now, and then you have to do that, and then you have to do that, you know? So like we good Germans are used to have <laughs> these plans, and then we work. <laughs> but really all the time, like a feedback loop, all, all the time mm -hmm. thinking, is this the right thing which I'm doing now? I hope, yeah, but always becoming more aware. For instance, I have a plant there out there, a wonderful yellow marguerite, and in summer, it needs a lot of water. And when I pass, it's like a habit. I always pass and see how are the leaves? Because as soon as they do a little bit like this, I know, oh, this needs water. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's what we need to do. To, to, yeah, it's to awareness. <laughs> it's awareness. It starts, you see, in leadership as well, if you, in, in a really self-leadership or leadership in general, it, it, the, the awareness part was missing. We, you know, if you look at all these business schools and with MBAs and the likes, uh, it's the, it was called development, leadership development. But you can't develop something because you're not a, before you not have an awareness. So you can develop like you would love to, till the ends of days. We've done it everywhere. We've done it in Africa. It didn't work. Why not? Because the awareness part was completely missing. As a baby, we can just take our lives back as a baby. As a baby, we became aware of the world around ourselves. And then we started developing all sorts of abilities and qualities and skills and the likes along the way. But the awareness is first of, and that's a sensory experience. We experience the world for our senses, inner and outer, not only outer, the five physical. Also, like you said, our intuition, our receptivity of what's going on around ourselves. 
And that part has not been nourished, nourished and nurtured at all. It's been ignored. Yeah. And we, we don't have even time to tap into, we didn't have time to tap into it in our, in our, in our de developing uh, years, you know, because it wasn't, it, people didn't realize the importance of it. And, and they, hence the just going, going, doing, doing stuff. Exactly. Not understanding what is the effect of my doing, because, and understanding comes from a Latin word, which means, and that's, I, that I discovered in sharing this journal, standing in the presence of. And, and, and that means I'm, I'm present to it. I'm, I'm, I'm really noticing what's there. It's outside of me. So I'm present to it of noticing what's going on. Because then I can realize, oh, wow, I cannot do that. It's going to fix. So there's a bird now eating our spinach. So instead of shooting the bird, I'm just going to hush the bird away. Because I don't want to kill the bird. But before, I would have just killed the bird, perhaps. Took out my gun. If I had a gun on the farm, I'd kill the bird. Because it's eating my spinach That's but now <laughs> the, the birds actually also cross-pollinating seeds they take seeds and they go and dump it elsewhere so the cycle of life continues so it's that awareness part is first before we want to develop anything yeah but it was a mental world that we lived in the age of reasoning and logic which was necessary at the time but now we're living in a different we really become this on a conceptual level whoa but what is that going if I'm going to shoot that poor bird, what for why would I want to do it in the first place? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Awareness is the basis, and then the courage of doing what you are of what your conclusions out of the awareness is, or the intuitions, I would almost say. So even if uh, the protocols say you have to do this and that and that and that. For instance, here in Italy, there was the protocol for the doctors at the beginning um, of the corona crisis that they shouldn't go to the patients, but only on the telephone. And practically the patients didn't have cure until they were so ill that they had to, to be brought to the hospital. And there were courageous doctors who said, no, if you are a doctor and are afraid to go to your patient, then you better don't do the, the, the practice, uh, the, the doctor, the profession. And so they went to their patients and from and cured them with what they thought is the right thing to do. And they connected with each other and uh, exchanged their, um, their observations. And I had interviews heard of, with these people and they said of their patients, nobody had to go to the hospital because they dared to oppose the instructions from Mipov, but did what they felt is the right thing to do. And this is, I think, that should be the future of, of our life in our societies. To be mm -hmm. responsible and morally stable, let's say, and, and do observe and do what you feel is right, despite you are not in accordance with the government law or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it reminds me of D.H. Lawrence's words. He said, uh, it's something to do with um, face the facts, but live beyond them. Yeah. And also the courage, when you spoke about courage, courage, the, the Latin word where courage comes from means living from the heart yeah. and taking action from the heart. So like that, those doctors you speak, they knew inside themselves, this is the right thing to do. And they did it regardless. And that's when you live beyond, you say, yes, you say, yeah, there are the facts, but I'm living beyond them. I'm doing what I feel. And that's where I also see us moving to it, towards, is we're beginning to do that. Even if it's small groups of people starting to do that. So we've been living like that here in Africa for a very long time. We had all these restrictions around us on many different levels since I've grown up, since I've been born. But we had, we had to thrive in some other way. Otherwise, we could have, you know, we could either go on the survival level or you can decide, no, I'm not doing that. Even with these conditions, I'm going to thrive. So you begin to live beyond that. And that's why I see what, what last year happened as well. Like you said, there were these boundaries. Um, and maybe it was not, um, you know, it was not in, from the inside out. It was imposed on us that we can see, but we have, we, we can't continue to let boundaries like that even keep us in to do the things that our hearts are telling us to do. 
can't stop doing them. We must just continue doing them. Exactly, exactly. And this is the practice, you know. When I came here to Italy, there were already, uh, still many people, older people, uh, who were in, let's say, in integral uh, in, in, in purple, like you have also in Africa, many people in purple. And they are still much nearer to their heart. And then it seems when you come into red, then the heart is sort of cut off, no? And we are now, and then blue, then the, the church tries to mm -hmm. rebuild the heart in some way, and orange again, they are throwing it out completely. And uh, green tries to come back to, to the heart and to the feelings, but it exaggerates us often, no? Uh, so maybe this is the time and that's our hope that people really come with all this experience which we have by traveling through all these mm -hmm. levels no? and that we come to a more complete i don't want to say understanding a complete application of the heart force you know that we can open the hearts in a in a different way not anymore on the purple way, but based on the purple way, very much based on the purple way. So how is this in Africa? Do you see that? <laughs> it's very interesting when you ask me that because it's, there are so many different layers here and also depends where in Africa you are. So having traveled in Africa and having had different experiences, it's very interesting to to notice people's reactions and the responses, how they react to what's happening in the world. Because what's happened, if I just take COVID now, it created a lot of fear here as well, but because of a different reason, not the same reasons why people most probably in Europe and the US had gone into fear. So it, it brings out- Tell me more about what, the, what is the reason there? Because we are not aware of that, you know? I think the, the, the on one level, it was not so frightening for people at all what happened. It was very strange. People just responded to it in a less fearful way. And it was the people who would see themselves on different levels, like green pe people, like people who if you take an integral view on it, perspective on it, green people or orange people, they were in fear. Not the people maybe acting out of purple. It was very interesting to watch it. So the levels of fear were, so the people who lived closer, who had still more that purple type um, perspective where they live from, had less fear because of these imp impositions on them. How do you think that uh, happened that these people have less fear? Is it because they are nearer to, to life and death circles or something? Or yeah, I think that if you go back to survival itself, because it's a part of your daily life mm -hmm. on what so many different levels. Whereas, because people in our townships, which we call our townships, who live in shacks, they didn't have that fear. And they were more exposed to COVID than we are in our little homes and, you know, safe in our four walls. They didn't, they had a lot more to fear than us, logically speaking, but they didn't. They, they ignored it. They just went on with their daily lives. They ignored masks, they ignored everything. They didn't have that fear. So maybe that survival, if you look at the primal energies within ourselves, because it's so more relevant every single day to survive every day on a physical level speaking now, that it didn't, it didn't create that fear. Whereas people who are detached from that type of survival in their own perspective, they feared it. They freaked out going to the shopping center to get food or to get medical. And still. So I think, I think that primal energy inside of ourselves of, of living a more closer to that primal and being way more aware of it every day and created less fear. And they talked about it as the white man's disease. They didn't even speak about it. They didn't even think they could get it. Yeah, because exactly. they have HIV, AIDS, and, and tuberculosis every single day. It's part of the reality. Yeah. So this, um, this small little virus, uh, why would we that thing? 
But it is, I think, it, if you, I'm talking to you about it now, where I feel it in my body, is a primal energy. It is that core life energy that they are all connected to because survival is part of their daily lives. A lot yeah. of things. And we have unlearned to be uh, in survival mode, and we have really shut it away uh, without knowing that at the bottom, we are still every day in survival mode. Every human, every being is in survival, no? needs to survive the day. But we have created a sort of pseudo security and safety around us that we think we are not, uh, uh, how do you say, under the natural law of life. We, have, we are far away, we are something special. And so when now a threat comes, by whatever reason or whatever intention or, you know, whatever comes, we feel, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I have to die sooner or later. <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you speak about, I just want to say something, uh, and that's on what you said about survival. I'll call it primal energy. It's not survival. It's our primal core energy inside of ourselves. Yeah. And lost connection with that and embodiment practices bring us back to that primal energy of feeling it and hearing it because it's, it has a sound. And when you connect to that and you step from there into the world, it doesn't matter what happens around yourself, you will not go into fear because you, it, but it's connected. It's not, it's integral. It's not, it's a connected, it's body, mind, art connection, but it is connected to a, a primal life energy in this moment. So hence, I will not fear whatever happens around me because I know that is what's driving me, not all these other things that I think should drive me. So how did you come to this point? This point is I have had a dream in 2010 and it was in the sand, it was written the language of energy. And 10 days later, I was on a plane to Los Angeles into something that I had no idea what I was getting involved in, but today I understand why I had to do that. And it is based on integral Bible. That's my first experience with integral with Ken Wilber and spiral dynamics and the IT and the likes. And it is a, it is a modality um, called um, Uzazu, which you, we work with these primal energies physically. Um, so it's through sound and breath work and movements. And then you, the first time I felt it in LA in my body, I was completely shocked of the power of it. I felt I could kill somebody with this energy because I could feel it in my cells. And that's how I came upon it. That was my introduction to integral, by the way. <laughs> so a dream led me there. And then I was just using, and I was in, and in that intensive, it was a 21 day intensive from seven in the morning till 11 at night. Um, it was really intense. I just, just started using it in whatever I'm doing, in, where, in whatever I'm sharing with the world and sharing it with people. Even in this change workshop, I'm sharing that on a very, very, on a very uh, surface level with people on how to soften change. But it, it, it really helped me to connect with that power. And then I realized why I was born in Africa because it, it's natural here where before, we, even though I grew up here, I had no connection with it. And that was where I had to, that I could reconnect with that primal energy inside of myself and understand even in terms of spiral dynamics and integral effect that has, because even at that stage, I was fighting some of the people in the US when they spoke about spiral dynamics and South Africa. And I was on my high horse and said, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm living here. I'm experiencing it every day. <laughs> but then to understand that perspective of people's perspective, oh, let's just go and save Africa. Because what do they know? They live on purple. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was also a hilarious experience on one level. It's quite humorous to have come from Africa into that type of environment and then to experience this primal energy myself in my body, not only mentally and emotionally, and then to have a, a much deeper understanding. So my awareness level transformed through that all. So just bringing that mean, the, con the, the conceptual together with the experiential which I'm really grateful for. What is curious that you found that in, in America. And <laughs> the other thing which I think, yeah, it's, um, I think that 
the place can be, how do you say, potentiated with energy. I'm completely sure that in Africa is a completely different energy than in Europe. We have had hundreds of years of culture, which is beautiful, but it's just another thing. And Africa is much more uh, down to earth. So it's no wonder that you are, as a person, when you go there, and when you live there, that you are influenced from, from the place, let's say, not only from the culture, but from this piece of piece of earth at the at the end, you know. And but I want to tell you something curious. that happened to me in Italy. <laughs> what, what happened to me in Italy, my first visit in, in Siena, the first, and after I had this long trip with three trains, and the last one is that those small trains. So you really get have to get high up to get into the train. But the first morning I woke up in Siena, here in the countryside, and I loved, I mean, I love Leonardo da Vinci. He's one of my big inspirations all my life, was to be close to the soil where he grew up. It was my, really my desire to just to touch the soil where he grew up. But the first morning I woke up, I completely dissolved into nature. Completely. There was no, I, there was my identity completely resolved. I was just, na I was nature. And so I knew I had very strong links with Italy for many different reasons. Um, and there I would really be, and then when I came back to South Africa, we went to the mountains with my, with my daughter and on the way to the mountains, again, I was just looking at the mountains and again, I just dissolved into nature. I had no sense of myself. I was completely one with nature, but it was in Italy. And I, and I had very similar experience in different parts of the world, like in Brazil, but not on this level. I didn't dissolve. I just deeply connected with everything around, the people and everything around me. But it was in Siena, in Italy, where I just dissolved. And I had no sense of myself anymore. <laughs> it was incredible. And I just cried after that for hours. <laughs> I believe that. No, Italy has, is, is really beautiful still, despite they do all sorts of sins to destroy. But it's just, it's, it's a dream. I mean, I, after 35 years I'm living here, I still love the country. I, the country in the sense of the nature, of what you see, of mm -hmm. what you... And that's really like on the old paintings, you know, the landscape is like this. I saw that fantasy when I saw them in the museums. And then I come here and oh, it's exactly so, you know, and it's, it's amazing. I'm still in love with the country, not with the administration and all this stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> also with the energy itself. With the I'm, soil, I'm fine. with yes. the soil, yeah. Yeah, with the this. soil, and also with the let's say the ground energy of the people who, as I said before, were much more collaborative and much more including. Mm -hmm. As an example, when you are not yet good in it Italian and you succeed to press out two or three words, they wait until you have said these words and they are happy, you know. <laughs> So in, in many ways, it's a wonderful way to live here, uh, you know, in many, many ways. As soon as you have to do with administration, then phew, no, it's not, but that's the price you pay. You don't get anything <laughs> gratis. So. <laughs> oh, and the last thing I want to ask you is, how can you tell people or even guide people into the sort of experience you were talking about today. So you you said zazu is a, a uzazu, technique. Uzazu, uzazu is the technique. But I've through the years I've added all other things to it. What I'm using currently is I've used its combination of many different things. Not only, but that was what really woke what woke this up in me to feel it on a physical level as well, not mm -hmm. only on a mental and spiritual level. So my whole website is full of experiences like that. Um, I've got a joy panorama, so it's embodied thinking, creative and embodied thinking workshops that people can download uh, in different contexts. So it's just very provocative contents, contexts that people can experience it for themselves through these type of techniques and, uh, and uh, many other things as well. Uh, so my website's full of that. But uh, and can, I you say, can you say your website? Can you spell it out? www.joygeneration.world 
So it's joygeneration.world. And then anybody who's interested, and we weave it in. I do it in, even in functional training, I brought it in. Like people would go on functional training in transportation in the business world, and I would, and they would ask me to help them to, you know, to help people just to get into this right frame of mind before the training starts. And then I do a small session with them. And it's, and it's very intuitive and it's very relaxed. And it just opens them up and they learn whatever they learn then after that, it's just easier uh, conceived and internalized. So you can apply it in, in strategic sessions, you can apply it in change initiatives. You can find anything, it's life, it's part of life. So whatever it is, people can connect with me uh, to, in, to share whatever, if, even if I look at integral, it's, you know, it's a way to experience it physically, not just talk about it. Yeah, and that's important. It can be embodied that people can live it out. Yeah, that's important because it's still missing in the integral community, this part yeah. of. And it's feeling and sensing it and playing with it and then directing it. And then you consciously start to direct it because you start to feel the energy and because it's beyond the words. So whatever perceptions you had about the words or your belief systems around it and your frames of references disappear because suddenly you start to follow the movement, the feeling of the energy. And you know, but this is a strong energy, so I must follow that. So your decision-making processes become more alive as well. Yeah. Do you do uh, trainings for, for, for people to then be able to also transmit this thing? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And we've got one coming up, which we call mascots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's to become a mascot. And there's other ways of it as well. So it, also, it all depends on what, how deep you want to go into. And I'm not teaching, uh, I'm a facilitator in Uzazu. So I share Uzazu as Uzazu, but I haven't kept up with their developments. I'm just whatever I share now, as, as like I said, I brought my own things into it of other stuff that I've learned about along the way that I'm including into it. So to help people to, on a, even if it's on a personal level or on a group level, to, to bring it into their lives. So you can even call it, do it as a coaching thing, you know, like I don't like the word coaching, but to bring these, include these into their lives and to begin to experience it. Mm -hmm. And you do normally workshops uh, live. I, I, so nice. Because there's, you open up the facility. Yeah. Uh, I, I prefer to do it live, but with our, in, with our um, what we've done last year, we've shared lots of bits and pieces in online sessions as well. So it was not as a program or as a core, I don't the word course, but as a program, but it, it, it uh, can be introduced in many different ways online as well. And in the change workshop that I've shared online now, uh, I'm using it as, as main practice to how to approach change. So I take them through all those aspects and we work there with 16 different levels. And we start off with eight and then take them through that, that to ex just to give them a gentle experience. Like I said, it's very at the top still. So just get a feeling for it. And then if people want to go deeper into it, they can, I would use that as a basis. And then to go deeper into to start feeling and playing with it more uh, with these different movements, sounds and breath work and also other, very, the creative mind because you want to open the creative mind. Yeah, a little okay. bit of experience we had in the women's group, you gave us some, some guidance in this. It's very, very nice and very um, to recommend yeah. to everybody. So oh, thank you. I th no, it's really, I really <laughs> appreciate what you're doing. We are, we're talking now about your work, but we started with the book. Maybe we should repeat yeah. where people can have this book. It's also these pictures you have put in and the, the poetry, the text, uh, poetic text, partly, not all of is poet, poesy. There's also normal text, let's say, but it's really very inspiring. And so for the end, say again how it is called and where people can get it. <laughs> Well, it's called Sharing Corn, Leadership and Self-Leadership Awareness Journal, Volume 2, Constructing and Embodying New Models of Understanding. And it's available on Amazon, Kindle, and it's also available on my website, www.joygeneration.world, where they can, the one on Amazon is not as colorful because Amazon Kindle has its limitations to with color, whereas the downloadable one on our website, it's, it's, you know, it's the same price. It's nine, 
$4.99, as you would get for all, most Kindles. Um, but the one on my on the website is much more colorful. That's the one that you are referring to with the, with the, with the pictures and everything. Wonderful. <laughs> it's inspiring uh, African colors, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a story around if, if you go and look at the look inside on the website there's the look inside version that you can just have a brief view of what's inside of it there is what there is the symbolism behind the horse and the bird and the corn mm -hmm. and how applicable in terms of awareness and of really co-creating together new models of understanding for humanity that all can thrive yeah but thank you Heidi yeah, thank you very much. It was so nice to talk to you. We should do that more often. <laughs> it's inspiring we should. my own and process. Also you know, wonderful. Uh, all sorts of different topics. I would love to hear the integral view of the piece that I shared about equality. Okay. Because we I can do that project and do that again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Today. Because I think that can help a lot of people. But thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.